At this time, let's begin today's event, Regaining Confidence, Assessing the Role of Alternative Data in a Changing Credit Landscape, sponsored by LexisNexis Risk Solutions and hosted by American Banker. I would now like to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Mike Sisk. Mike, you now have the floor. Hello, everyone. Very glad you could join us for today's program. I'm Mike Perkowski, your moderator. Please that you could take a few minutes out of your busy day to learn more about our topic, Regaining Confidence, Assessing the Role of Alternative Data in a Changing Credit Landscape. Before we go any further, I do want to take a moment to again acknowledge and thank LexisNexis Risk Solutions for their sponsorship of this program. We appreciate their support greatly. Today we're fortunate to have two expert speakers who are going to cover the, our topic and if we have time, be able to answer a few questions at the back end of our program today. Ankush Tiwari is Vice President for Credit Risk and Collection Strategy at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. In this role, he leads the credit risk, marketing, digital credit risk, and collections verticals, and is responsible for the strategy, growth, and revenue performance for each market. Ankush is responsible for the credit risk and marketing solutions designed for prospecting, traditional, and digital marketing, and credit account opening across industries. For collections, he oversees solutions for collections decisioning, skip tracing, repossession, litigation, and other use cases. And for digital credit risk, he leads the launch of solutions to evaluate the credit worthiness of borrowers in emerging markets using non-traditional digital data assets and help lenders provide a path to credit and financial inclusion. He previously held roles at Dun & Bradstreet and Genpact. We're also glad to have Dr. Jeffrey Feinstein, Vice President for Global Analytics and Strategy at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. In that role, he oversees domestic and global statistical development and analytic projects for financial services and related areas such as retail, telecom, and utilities, as well as government and healthcare. Dr. Feinstein has been a thought leader in risk and fraud analytics and credit bureau scoring for over 20 years. He currently leads innovation efforts to bring new analytic solutions, techniques, and content to the marketplace, and he particularly focuses on isolating data patterns descriptive of synthetic and other compromised identities, as well as enhancing financial inclusion opportunities for underserved consumers. We're fortunate to have both of these gentlemen here today, so I'm going to start by turning the program over first to Ankush Tawari. Ankush, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Mike. And uh, welcome, everyone. We're excited to uh, share our insights with you today. So let me start with just talking about changes and challenges to the credit landscape. Um, obviously, you know, we are in the middle of a crisis that uh, none of us have any experience uh, kind of dealing with. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's really caused us to have to rethink how we do everything and how we, and certainly credit is you know, one of the, the main things that we have to rethink. So since March, you know, we have seen kind of historical uncertainty uh, introduced into the credit environment, um, both in terms of the scale and the nature of the, of the disruption. Um, and, and that has caused you know, real shifts in the credit-seeking population where we're seeing you know, the demand for credit uh, you know, shifting subprime and younger and then bouncing back from that and changing. Uh, to, to, to the point where we really are having a hard time understanding what is going on uh, you know, in terms of the credit worthiness of consumers uh, everywhere. And one of the things that was interesting to me to see is you know, when, when, as I was watching the news, just like everyone on the webinar, and trying to predict what is going to happen uh, with credit in the future, I fully expected that you know, American consumers were going to use up a lot of their available credit because of uncertain times, because people were losing jobs, because people needed cash. Um, and the funny thing is, is that the inverse happened. And it really got us you know, within LexisNexis thinking about uh, you know, how are we going to help our customers understand kind of the changing shape of credit when credit when consumers are behaving in ways that are not necessarily easy to predict using kind of traditional insights. So, you know, one of the things that obviously now we know um, is, is really changing consumer behavior, right, is the stimulus package, new regulations, 
Um, you know, the things that the government has done, has stepped in to do to help us weather the storm have been kind of, uh, you know, bolstering consumers. Uh, but at the same time, it makes it very difficult to understand what is really happening out there. Um, and, you know, as they say, like, your first pandemic is always going to be the hardest because no one has any experience uh, dealing with this. But I think we're going we're gonna to do our best to, sh to share some light, uh, some insights, and uh, shed some light on the matter. So let's start with just a quick picture of just setting the, you know, kind of setting the stage. Uh, let's talk a little bit about demand and credit quality. So one of the things we saw, uh, at least in the first, you know, part of this pandemic, was a, a steep drop in, uh, in, in demand for credit. Um, you know, the CFPB reported out uh, uh, a tremendous drop in, in volume uh, in multiple industries for credit. Um, you know, this is uh, automotive credit seeking. And so between the first week of March and the fourth week of March, you can see that the overall there was a 52% drop in credit seeking behavior. Um, and this was most uh, this was sort of most prominent in the super prime consumers, who dropped more than 67 percent uh, from between the beginning of March to the end of March. So 30 percent more than the average U.S. consumer. And the same picture is, holds true in credit card. Overall, we saw uh, a 40 percent drop in credit card inquiry volume across the country. And the shift was much more uh, prominent in superprime, where 50, almost 50 percent more, uh, 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 you know, credit card seeking behavior slowed by almost 50 percent more than the average consumer from the beginning of March to the end of March. And it's, it really is unprecedented. You know, I've, we've never really seen any anything that quite matches up with this. So now let's talk a little bit about the credit quality that we're seeing. So here is a picture of the distribution of credit optic scores um, between, uh, from uh, January and February of 2020. So you can see that this kind of follows a fairly um, you know, normal pattern. Um, and you know, the center here is probably sitting right around uh, that 600 to 700 uh, credit scoring bin. Uh, so then what happened in March and April? Well. Applicants for retail cards shifted towards subprime uh, quite a bit. So you can see uh, the kind of gold line and the red line for, April, uh, for March and the gold line for April both switched dramatically towards the lower end of the spectrum. And that's because those borrowers, uh, as we showed on the prior slide, you know, prime borrowers, super prime borrowers, simply stopped inquiring for credit. So the remaining population shifted towards the subprime. So then things kind of got settled in, um, and you know, in May, June, and July, uh, we started to see a little bit of a rebound. So you can see here, uh, May, June, and July, May is the orange line, and then June and July, kind of the darker purplish lines. We're, we're starting to get back to where we were in January and February, that blue dash line, but we're not quite there yet. And so, you know, we, you know, we're going to keep monitoring credit quality and uh, and see if we actually get back to kind of a January, February levels of inquiries, which probably will be a good thing for the economy. So, what is, you know, what are we really getting at here, right? What's the takeaway? The takeaway is that consumers are being heavily impacted by this by this pandemic, um, but. The distress is not clear. So the stimulus has been helping. Um, that stimulus is going to perhaps be renewed in you know, the form that it was earlier this year, or it may take a different form, or it may not come back in a way that helps consumers at all. So there's a lot of uncertainty in, in, uh, in, in the consumer base. And what we know we can do is kind of divide out consumers into three cohorts. Um, and, and we can see this in our data, right? So one cohort is the non-distressed consumers. Uh, these consumers were stable pre-COVID. They've basically maintained their income. They've reduced expenses. They've paid down debt. And they tend to be older and more stable. Uh, this is more, you know, they sort of tend to be more from the boomer generation or the Gen X generation. Then you've got a middle cohort of consumers that are distressed. Um, they are less stable than they were pre-COVID. 
but they had some savings and they had some credit liquidity and they're probably being very careful with their spending right now. Some of them may have lost their jobs, but they may have had savings you know, to lean upon or family members to lean upon. They're depending on the stimulus and the forbearance and they're kind of delaying their distress. So here, you know, we're seeing kind of, you know, this cohort is probably more in the Gen X and millennial uh, generations. And then there's, uh, you know, the highly distressed consumers. So uh, even pre-COVID, they were probably near a cliff. Uh, they, you know, were, were uh, maybe living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, they probably had very little savings. They most likely lost their job. Uh, the stimulus and the forbearance may be keeping them afloat. This may be the cohort that's actually making a little bit more money right now than they were pre-pandemic, but that you know that there's that's that's temporary. And this is also the group that's probably the least able to deal with a $400 emergency. And so, what's going to happen to this cohort once things sort of return to normal and forbearance and uh, you know things like that start forbearance programs start to end, eviction programs start to end. Um, that's going to be, uh, you know, anyone's guess, but it's going to be that portion of the of the population that lenders are really going to be concerned about. So one of the th ways we wanted to take a stab at uh, kind of defining what does it mean, right? This this distress. Um, so we we thought we'd look at credit utilization in cards. Um, you know, recently I read a Wall Street Journal article that discussed how uh, Americans have been paying down debt, um, and you know our data supports that view as well. So you can see here, uh, this is change in credit usage over one year from Q2 of 2019 through Q2 of 2020, and you can see that 90% of the population uh, has been. Uh, decreasing credit card utilization, and that marries up with you know publicly uh, published figures by the Wall Street Journal and others. Americans have been taking this time to reduce spending and pay down debt, and credit card debt has been one of the areas where they have really paid uh, you know made great strides paying down their debt. But of course, it's not everyone, right? The net effect is that credit card balances are down across the country, but there is a pocket of the population that has increased their credit utilization. So that's that orange slice, the roughly 10% um, of the population that has increased their utilization. Now within there, we can segment out three cohorts, right? So one is relatively small increases in balance to limits over year over year. Uh, that's 30% of that population. Um, and then relatively large increases in balance to limits, that's about 17% of the population. And then balances to limits that more than doubled over the year, that's 53% of this population. So the way to think about it is, you know, of this 10% of consumers that have increased their utilization roughly half, or sort of mild to moderate increases, but half of them, representing you know five percent of the overall uh, pool, um, are are more than doubling um, their balances over the last year, and that clearly is a sign of distress that uh, we need to keep an eye on. So, because that's not uh, you know not not very easy to see or predict, or it's easy to see it you know sort of in hindsight. It's a little bit more difficult to predict um, that effect. You know, one thing that we, we predicted lenders would do, and we're seeing it in our data, is that uh, they're not going to be as confident booking applicants anymore. And so the actual booking rate of applicants um, has gone down. So you can see on the left, we have kind of this uh, pre-pandemic 2019 benchmark um, of booked rates. So approval rates, you know, roughly between 50 and 60 percent there. Uh, and then in 2020, pre-pandemic, you know, we were chugging right along. Uh, during the early part of the pandemic, uh, approvals dropped precipitously. Um, and then again, that ties back to that shift to subprime inquiries uh, that I showed a couple of slides earlier. Uh, and then it's very, very slightly rebounded back in kind of this mid-pandemic uh, time period. So, you know, lenders are no longer approving borrowers at the same rate that they were pre-pandemic and, and in 2019. And of course, that's a problem, right? That, that, that is an economic problem when, you know, what we really need to help pull us out of this financial crisis is growth. Consumers are going to need access to credit. Lenders are going to need, you know, high quality 
uh, customers that are not going to default, and they need to be able to tell the difference between the two. So the trouble, of course, is that traditional credit data provides an incomplete picture, and this is you know, well known. Um, consumers have changed how they kind of build and manage credit in the last 20 years, compared to the last 20 years. Um, but uh, you know, the entire sort of industry infrastructure is relying on the same signals, uh, which is an incomplete picture of consumers. Um, and like I said before, you know, th we have gaps in visibility that have been exacerbated in 2020 because of forbearance, uh, because of the stimulus programs, and because of all the uncertainty that's out there. So for us, you know, we, you know, alternative data to us exists to paint a more complete picture. So once you get beyond your sort of traditional trade lines, right, your credit card, installment loans, auto and mortgage, um, you know, lenders should be taking look, a look at other things like education history, public records, professional licenses. This is some of the stuff that uh, LexisNexis has been uh, providing to lenders for years, and also uh, insights that, into alternative credit. Uh, so things like online lending, uh, inquiry volumes and applications, subprime lending, and telecommunications that may not show up on a traditional credit file, all are providing insights into this consumer. And you know the consumer picture, it's even more important now to get as much data as you can because the sort of traditional data sources are going to lose signal effectiveness. So... Jeffrey Feinstein, my colleague, is going to take you through the next part of the story where he's going to dig into this a little bit and kind of show how alternative data uh, and traditional data together can kind of can paint the picture of the consumer in a very different way to you. <clears throat> Jeffrey? Thank you very much, Ankush. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, so Ankush set up this nice picture about the interaction between, say, traditional credit data and all the other sorts of data available and how that might say, help weather the storm. Uh, before kind of going on, I'm going to dig a little bit into the traditional data. Um, and I'm just going to share this one picture with you. Um, this comes from um, uh, FICO. And it really just describes what's in a credit score. Very, very quickly, it really covers five fundamental areas. Payment history, think of that as delinquency sorts of information, have people pay their bills on time. Amount owed, um, that um, at the bottom of the graph, that's a little bit less strong than payment history, uh, and that's mostly your balances, your burden, your, your ratio of balances to limits, things like that. Length of credit history, which really um, gets at whether someone has a vast experience or not a lot of experience. Those with more experience tend to be a little bit less risky. And two smaller uh, predictors, that's credit mix, the ver variety in the loans that you have, and new credit, that is, are you really credit hungry or are you relatively stable in the credit? And FICO shared, um, as part of that, the relative value of each of those in predicting credit delinquency. Now, those values, that, they're not really hard-coded. It varies a lot by age and demographic and how, much, um, and, and how much credit you have, what we would call thin file, thick file. But generally, um, those percentages indicate the amount of uh, predictive value that those fields have. And what we've seen in the past year is a real change in how those sorts of variables are predicting um, subsequent pet credit performance. What you see in that bar chart is a change in predictive value from a score built using those variables in 2019 to one built in 2020. So we're basically comparing predictive patterns of these analytic elements uh, before the pandemic and in, 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 in sunnier times in 2019 and seeing how those predictive changes or how those predictive elements have changed in 2020. And you see things like or elements like length of credit history and balance are significantly less predictive of subsequent behavior than they were in 2019. By the same token, we see certain variables have increased in their value, delinquency or whether you've um, a consumer has paid their bills on time in the past, and their credit balance have increased in their predictive value in a model built in 2000 and with 2020 data compared to one built with 2019 data. And there's really three takeaways here. Those who have struggled in the past will struggle more in an economic fallout of COVID-19. What I'm referring to there is simply delinquency. Whereas delinquency was predictive in 2019, it's even more important in helping to understand how a consumer will weather the storm based on 2020 data. 
Second, t- traditional predictors like credit experience, which is a relatively strong predictor of credit behavior um, in typical credit scoring models, is a little bit less predictive than it used to be. That generally says that something that had been a strong predictor in the past, less predictive now because there are other elements that are affecting consumers regardless of their credit history. Third, there's been an uncoupling of balances and credit utilization. Balances being the the second bar, the second yellow bar, and utilization being the third bar. Those usually work in tandem. What I mean by that is balance and utilization. Utilization is the ratio of balances to credit limits. So usually as balances go up, utilization goes up. And so they're they're usually kind of one and one um, in a predictive model. What it means when they become uncoupled is that it's more than how much you owe. It's really how how close you get to that edge that becomes the real differentiator there. It's not so much the balances. That's a little bit less important than it used to be. It's the proximity to the edge. The higher utilization, the higher your balances are relative to your limit. So it's really saying that credit liquidity is a little bit more important than amount owed. And that's really, uh, that's really different, so a, a different pattern we're seeing in 2020 than we typically see in prior years in, in, in non-economic strife. So that's really kind of interesting. And then when we kind of um, look at the same relationship, and this is the same slide that Anka showed, we definitely see that credit bureau behaviors are changing quite a bit. Looking at a measure like utilization, 90% of consumers are actually seeing a decrease in utilization. What that means is just generally it means that those consumers are, are, are less risky than they used to be. And we see that story um, um, in, in a variety of different articles. Anka cited a couple. We're seeing some press releases from um, some of the credit bureau score vendors and so forth about generally c- consumer health is increasing. And if you take a step back and think about what this pandemic means and what the economic implications of it mean, it's, it's kind of clear that at a macroeconomic level, you might see that. So, for example, we see that unemployment has increased to roughly the 10, 11 percent rate. Um, what that means is 90% of consumers have maintained their jobs, and at the same time, while maintaining their income, their expenses have changed dramatically. The, um, large in- decreases in travel expenses, large decreases in um, 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 fuel um, expenses for, for the price of commutes, our entertainment budgets have gone way down. So really, this pandemic has put a lot of consumers in, in a much, quote unquote, healthier place, at least financially. But at the same time, what that macroeconomic improvement is really showing is that it's hiding um, a group that's under enormous financial distress, 10 percent who are increasing their credit utilization. And as Anko shared, you can really see that in the utilization limits. Excuse me, the utilization changes, where half of those who are increasing their balance have more than doubled their overall credit utilization, have more than doubled their balance relative to their spending power. That is a really troubling trend that can be hidden by some of these larger macroeconomic trends. And in a sense, what we're really seeing is there are consumers with starting distress. That's that 30 percent who are just kind of seeing small increases in their balance relative to their spending ability all the way through to high distress. Those are people who are doubling that utilization, who are are getting closer and closer to the edge. And we really, really want to dig into into those consumers and how we could better assess uh, consumers who are experiencing that distress. So we can design a study and test some of these hypotheses. First, how did consumer profiles shift prior to the onset? So simply looking at a time period, starting in January through April, we can look at the short-term impacts of the quarantine. In data science terms, these are very, very short windows. But we want to look at how a change from January 2020 led to some sort of credit profile change in April 2020, very short term, and then take that information, particularly, say, calling April 2020 a scoring date, and look to see the financial distress that occurred just two or three months later, taking another measure at June 2020, the distress measure after April 2020, and say, is there a way that we can then build solutions or build a way to identify those who are most likely to experience that distress before they experience that distress. So if we measure them in April, can we do a better job of 
of identifying who will have that distress um, two or three months later. So for example, during that early period, I'm talking about from January through to April, we see about three-fourths of the population don't have a substantive change in credit bureau score. They have a, a, we measure the credit score in January, and we measure a credit score in April, and we see that the credit score is largely consistent in that time. In other words, there's not a really great change in one's overall ability to pay their bills, at least as measured by traditional data. We do see those sorts of changes in about a fourth of the population. But where the real risk is for both consumers and the industry is in that 75% and say, can we better understand the, the changing nature of distress for those that aren't seeing a traditional data change so that we can he either help with certain programs or at least we can be aware of the changing nature of that distress in our underwriting campaigns. And in fact, when we look at that 75%, it's actually 76.2%, we see that a lot of them don't see a lot of that sort of distress in the next two or three months. Keep in mind, that's a very, very short period of time to see a volatile change in one's credit standing. But in the subsequent months, we actually see about 25% or 30%, it's actually 29%, see a relatively large increase in their balances relative to limits even though they've had almost no credit bureau score change just prior to that. So what we're seeing is that there's a lot of credit distress happening in very, very short periods of time, and that the credit bureau score isn't entirely enough to help diagnose who will and won't see that stress. So we can dig into that trend. So first we can look at the alternative credit um, from online lending, subprime lending, basically fintech sort of lending um, that Ankush described, and see that using those sorts of solutions rank order very, very nicely. And just for the record, these are indexed. So um, all the results are relative to median alternative credit risk. So we can then take those sorts of analytic solutions, and we could say, well, if we have somebody who has alternative data credit risk, we see that they're far more likely to have credit distress. So the performance definition here is, in the next two or three months, are they likely to, to come close to their, their limits? Are they likely to lose their credit liquidity as they're coping? Now, importantly, this is a population that hasn't had a change in credit bureau score. So given that from January to April, their credit score has changed, how does an alternative, excuse me, their credit bureau score has not changed, how does alternative data help to identify those who will or will not have credit stress in the, in the subsequent two or three months? And we see that it's about 35% higher rate of credit distress with those who have a high alternative credit risk, and it's about half as risky, actually, half as much distress for those who have much less risky alternative data trends. I can't emphasize that enough, that by adding information incremental to that credit bureau data, we're able to have far more insight to credit distress shortly thereafter. We can then look at some of the data. Um, for example, inquiries, particularly fintech and subprime inquiries, are very, very important for those sorts of solutions. And you can see among those, again, among those who credit bureau score is relatively standard, it's in the 625 to 675 range, we see a big increase in the, in the distress rate of those who have um, one or more credit inquiries. And we see an even greater distress rate among those who have subprime inquiries. In other words, again, holding credit score, traditional credit score constant, we're seeing an influx of these sorts of inquiries leading to consumers who are experiencing credit distress. I'm just going to pause right now just so that we can kind of absorb that. We can also look at non-credit events. So for example, as part of our non-credit data score, we call it risk view, um, we have a couple of indices. These indices are meant to rank order consumers 
or identify consumers based on their ability, basically their asset wealth, and that asset wealth helps to weather storms, their stability that ranges from highly transient to highly stable, basically how stable is their mode of living, um, and it's largely related to um, – um, um, I, I hate to use um, – circular definitions, but the stability with which they have their life, those with a lot of volatility in that, in that lifestyle um, are going to be much greater risk than those who are stable, and their willingness um, to pay. The willingness index rank orders one's historical delinquency in the past, where um, people range from high willingness to low willingness, essentially indicating alternative data signals around derogatory behavior. Let me dig in a little bit here. Looking at consumers' ability, we see nice rank ordering. And again, these are indexed to medium. Those who have a high ability are more able to weather the storm, have less credit distress than people who are medium or low in ability. So put it this way, the more asset wealth you have, the more wealth you have in general, the more able you are to weather a storm, the less likely you are to have the credit distress that we've been talking about. At the same time, looking at, say, something around stability, we see something kind of interesting and a little bit different. Those who are very stable are much less likely to have that financial distress. Those who are more established are less likely to have credit distress. Keep in mind, again, we're looking at people with a very narrow range of credit bureau score changes from January to, um, to April. Um, those who have that kind of stable mode of living are much less likely to have the credit distress and, in fact, weather the storm quite well. It doesn't matter for low and medium. These are very, very similar results. It doesn't matter all that much. Those who are more transient or those who are not very stable, the pandemic is, is affecting them and their credit distress roughly equally. By the same token, when we look at a history of delinquency, we see that those who are low in their historical willingness to pay are likely to experience a lot more credit distress. The pandemic has been roughly an equal opportunity for those who have been paying their bills on time. Basically, whether you have been paying or, um, your bills on time or have a medium delinquency, it's relatively um, similar. It's really those who have historically had trouble are having even more trouble. And this adds a layer on top of what we've been seeing for credit bureau-based um, solutions. So I'm going to hand, um, hand the microphone back over to Ankush to really talk about how to bring these sorts of solutions together as we think about um, how we can, together as an industry, weather the storm. Ankush? Thank you, Jeffrey. So let me talk a little bit about just alternative data and our vision as a company for alternative data. You know, we alternative data is really a core part of our strategy um, to bring together kind of unique solutions uh, that we can take into market. So our job as a company, I think, is to build solutions that are complementary uh, to what a credit bureau provides. Uh, that's how our customers have been using our data for, you know, for many years. And we're so excited that our two companies, LexisNexis Risk Solutions and ID Analytics, have come together to really bring what we believe is a very predictive, unique combination of alternative data to market. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I think some of the feedback our customers have been giving us is, you know, you know, it, it, there really hasn't been a more a, a time where we need alternative data more uh, than we do today. So again, coming back to this graphic, it, it's 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 worth noting what all is on here. So we start with traditional credit, um, and all of you are familiar with that. And then we add on, you know, the LexisNexis data asset, which is non-credit events, um, and and really speak to kind of diff a different. A view of the consumer. So education history, public records, and by public records, um, you know, we, we're talking about uh, things like, uh, you know, asset history, property ownership, uh, court records, uh, and then professional licenses. And here, you know, again, uh, you know, these days, 
I think uh, our customers are really curious about, or really are asking a lot about, you know, are you know are these borrowers employed somewhere? And while professional licenses doesn't tell you if someone is employed, it does tell you if you know someone is, for example, a registered nurse or a plumber or an electrician. And that insight is valuable uh, when you're trying to take into consideration the entire riskiness of the borrower. And then you add on now the alternative credit um, solutions, uh, the alternative credit piece. So things like online lending and subprime lending, which you may not see any indication of on a traditional credit bureau report, but those kind of off-balance sheet uh, loans and transactions are very, very predictive in terms of finding out the total risk of the borrower. Uh, and finally, the telecommunications piece, you know, where uh, we we have, uh, you know, a, a very, very robust view into the activities of, uh, into into the borrowing activities of people who are seeking out telecommunications services. So you bring all of that together, and uh, we think that this is really something unique that we're going to be able to offer the market. Um, but you know the proof is in the pudding. You have to you have to be able to show that there's actually an improvement or some sort of reason uh, for a, a customer to add this on to their uh, traditional processes. And so, in our early testing, um, you know we see uh, a tremendous amount of benefit. You know I've been doing this for many years. I've been with LexisNexis Risk Solutions for nine years, and you know we we've tried lots of different data sources and. Um, when you know we saw these kind of uh, effects, we were very we, you know this is a this is a sit up straight in your chair moment. Uh, so what we see is that when we bring all of these uh, data assets together, we're getting 30% lift over you know over Lexus's traditional uh, you know alternative credit solution. So we've been in this market for many years. Um, so you know when we see 30% lift, um, that's something that gets us very excited. Uh, another thing is, you know, we're we're seeing 99% uh, scorable rates. 99% uh, scorable rates for U.S. consumers is virtually unheard of. Now, in the Lexus world, you know, our scorable rates were already sort of in the mid to you know, call it 95 plus percent range. Uh, but then, you know, the combination of uh, the ID analytics assets, you know, raises that even more. And so the, it, it does mean that you know, lenders can do more automated credit decisioning. Um, and finally, this is a point that you know, I think is increasingly important and will be through the pandemic and beyond, which is that we see stronger financial inclusion when you use alternative data along with credit bureau data. So with scorable rate increases, plus finding signals that are, you know, go beyond a person's traditional credit, um, you know, that's where you start to see the impact of alternative data into bringing people into mainstream credit that may not be there today and may actually be shut out uh, today because they're, they're, you know, they, they don't either, ha they either have not enough credit history or, you know, there's something in their credit bureau data that's preventing them from getting access to credit. So that's, you know, this is uh, sort of what gets, gets us excited about the combination of the, of the assets. So uh, let me just recap kind of what we talked about today. Um, the first thing is that consumer behavior does not yet fully reflect economic distress. We all know it's coming. We all read the news. But we know that you know, our stimulus programs and other things that have been put in place to prevent the economy from going into freefall are helping borrowers, and they are keeping things stable for now. And you know, while we... Uh, all want that to continue. You know, we know that the stimulus can't last forever. Um, the second thing is, you know, we we're seeing that traditional credit data um, is maybe not the only. It's, it's not the best tool. It's certainly not the only tool that lenders should be using to figure out what's the riskiness of borrowers today. Um, you know, traditional credit bureau data is extremely predictive. It's the industry standard, and it'll never go away. Um, but in, in uncertain times where consumers are changing behaviors dramatically, uh, it certainly can't be the only source of data that you're using to help manage your risk. Alternative data um, is showing very strong results in correlating with the distress signals that we're seeing in 2020. 
So as Jeffrey walked through, you know, multiple slides of how alternative data is correlating with elevated and uh, reduced levels of risk in the population, uh, that should give lenders confidence that you know these are tools that may make a difference uh, as you try to manage the risk of your booked portfolio, as well as new borrowers um, that you take on as we come out of the pandemic. Uh, and finally, you know, what we're doing at LexisNexis Risk Solutions is making alternative data essential data. Our acquisition of ID Analytics, I think, brings together two of the best data assets in market, and we are excited to take something that is really different and never seen before uh, into market uh, later on this year. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Mike, but uh, I really want to thank everyone in the audience for, uh, for coming in. Uh, and we are going to uh, uh, move towards Q&A. So, Mike, back to you. Great. Thank you, Ankush and Jeff. Thank you very much for sharing a lot of data, a lot of good insight with our audience. We do have a lot of questions that we want to try to get to momentarily. Before we do, we have one quick question uh, that we would like to pose to our audience. Uh, if you would just simply tell us. Uh, if you would like to learn more about LexisNexis Risk Solutions, alternative data solutions, and you would like to have a sales representative contact you. Choices are very simple, of course, yes or no. If you would just let us know that, and the, those who do say yes, I'm sure the folks at LexisNexis will be in contact with you very closely to follow up. Okay, I'm just going to give everybody else a moment to give us your answer on that. And then we're going to transition. All right, now we're going to transition to the Q&A part of our program. So we do have a number of excellent questions. So let's see uh, where we can where we can go to first. Okay. So for uh, Ankush and Jeff, I'll let you guys fight it out as to which of you will answer this first. But we have a very simple question: Is all this data FCRA compliant? Mike, I'm going to take that. This is Ankush. Uh, yes, it's so it's a good question. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, all of this data, and, and and I know that in particular, sometimes this is a, a question about, uh, you know, uh, there's there's questions about the alternative data. Everything we talked about today, all the uh, underlying data sources and the uh, scores, they are all FCRA compliant. Um, and you know, LexisNexis Risk Solutions. Ha is a consumer reporting agency. We have all the infrastructure needed to deal with adverse action notices, consumer uh, disclosures, corrections, uh, all of the things that are required under the FCRA. Uh, we we you know we comply with 100%. We've been doing this for many years, um, and yes, all of these all of these data assets, these scores, and everything else we talked about are FCRA compliant. That's a good question. Great, let's go on to our next question then. Our member in the audience wants to know, is the utilization increase due to lowering of credit limits by banks? Um, Ankush, I think that one's for me. Um, go ahead. I'm sure it's a combination of increased balance and decreased limits. We do see a trend towards uh, credit controls happening from financial institutions. I think the area of distress is largely um, in the liquidity of consumers. So it doesn't matter if balances are going up or limits are going down. What it's doing is um, hurting flexibility of a consumer to weather the storm. That said, those who are increasing their balances um, relative to their limits versus those who have their limits change on their behalf are probably under a little bit more distress, to your point, or to at least to the nature of the question. But um, I, we're really tapping into um, distress of limits coming closer to balances, whether balances go up or limits go down. Great. Thank you very much. Let's go to our sure. next Our audience wants, member wants to know, do you recommend leveraging these insights on top of my existing credit bureau score or as a replacement to that assessment? So Jeffrey, I'll start with that, and then uh, please feel free to add anything on. So typically our customers will use this data on top of their existing bureau scores and solutions. So 
Uh, we don't typically recommend that you rip out you know, bureau infrastructure and replace it with this, but we do see, and I mean, you know, we have, uh, you know, there's many, many, many hundreds of financial institutions and others uh, all across the country that leverage alternative data because it adds on to what you're getting from your credit bureau. So, you know, all the predictive power that you're getting from your bureau, this does add on to it. Uh, and that's why, you know, that's why, frankly, we have customers is because we're able to provide an ROI for them. But yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Uh, we definitely recommend that you use the alternative data as an add-on to your existing bureau scores. I think Ankur said it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. So let's go to our next question. Can we weed out those customers who got the federal stimulus in, in order to understand whether this amount was significant to the estimated income and how that benefit affected or benefited, uh, that income uh, benefited or affected the June 2020 statistic? So, um, Ankrish, I'll cover that one. Um, there, there's a lot behind that question. Um, and so I'm just going to take a step back and just talk about a couple of things, particularly around the, um, the PPP loans that were, that were issued. Um, and that is, and, and I'm going to cover another question as well that talks a little bit about inquiries decreasing in March and they're coming back. Um, to the moderator, in that we definitely saw transactions decreasing, and everything just became everything just blew up when PPP was in, in order, and so we saw some interesting things. We saw, for example, that that generally credit shopping decreased dramatically, but we saw as PPP came on two major trends. First of all, we saw a recovery in transactions, both for consumers and for businesses, by the way. Um, we saw them transacting in both of those different channels, and we saw dramatic change in the credit risk profiles of those. So the PPP loans are really those who are just trying to maintain their – that they're just trying to stay above water as opposed to being, say, um, a sign of true credit distress. We, those PPP loans were issued to very low-risk consumers. That's kind of one story. Um, by the way, we saw a huge uptick in those PPP loans coming from um, coming from the fintech industry. In other words, non-traditional lenders compared to um, compared to say uh, traditional lenders. And we also saw that it was migrating to. Um, smaller and smaller businesses throughout the course of the PPP loan. It started really with large businesses and it ta tapered down. We have definitely seen, though, transactions kind of re um, returning back. I'm not going to say they were near normal, and in fact, the retail industry was particularly um, hit, but transactions are generally occurring. They're still suppressed. Um, but there's one area that just blew away all the other areas when it comes to that sort of transaction volume, and that are general transactions. These aren't credit inquiries per se, but we saw a whole lot in the digital channel related to payments. We saw a huge migration from cash to digital payments. Think the PayPals and the Venmos and the Zells, all, were all kind of migrating to digital channels. And I'm not going to say that those were covered. I'm going to say that those have been elevated and stayed elevated throughout the time period. So I answered a couple of questions that I saw there. Um, so. Okay, very good, thanks. So let's go on to our next question. Our audience member wants to know, are there any pending COVID-19 related changes to the risk view score? Uh, so I can take that one, Jeffrey. Uh, I mean, we are doing a tremendous amount of work to improve and you know, continually enhance the risk view score, uh, including kind of what I mentioned uh, in my last couple of slides, which is bringing the risk view alternative data together with the ID analytics alternative data. So while it's not specifically COVID related, um, you know, stepping back, kind of the point of you know what we're what we're saying here is that. Uh, in an uncertain environment, you know, the more alternative data you have, the more, you know, the better you will, you will be able to actually predict risk. So we are making enhancements to risk view score. 
we are bringing together risk view and ID analytics data, but it's not specific to COVID as the, as the questioner asked. Okay, excellent. Another uh, audience member wants to know, how is LexisNexis alternative data different or better than Experian slash TU? Um, okay, so I'll I'll take that one as well. Um, so it, let's let's uh, I, I'm not going to speak to whether it's better than our competitors or not. Um, that comes out very clearly in testing, right? So our lenders will uh, take files from us and our competitors, and uh, we participate in you know champion challenger type of testing bake offs all the time. So how we are different. Um, you know, the first thing is just to speak to kind of the risk view data. Um, you know, the risk view data is really a unique collection of public record assets plus proprietary data that is all packaged together in, uh, you know, a solution that is FCRA compliant, as I mentioned, and it's consumed really side by side with credit bureau data. So, you know, no other company has that, you know, that particular combination of uh, you know, public records and other data that we that we pull together in RiskView, and the same is true for ID Analytics. You know, ID Analytics really has unique insight into kind of online lending and alternative lending, subprime lending, uh, and telecommunications. And so, when we package all of that together, uh, we think that's going to be a very, very different and predictive uh, solution set to take into market. Um, our, you know, the credit bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, um, you know, Equifax as well. They have, you know, their own data. Obviously, they have their traditional, um, they have their traditional credit bureau data, um, and you know, each of them have bought a payday loan trade line data company over the years, and that's kind of really what they mean by alternative data. So, uh, ours is is very very different uh, than what the bureaus are offering. Um, and you know the best way to really compare them is is uh, to 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 do the analytics to test. Great. We have uh, time for just a couple more questions. So let's go with this one. What what tools do you have to help predict fraud that is disguised as credit losses? Ankush, I'll take that one. Um, yeah. So we we we're generally tracking fraud and identity patterns. Um, throughout time, and we saw some a couple of just interesting facts uh, before we before I kind of answer the question more directly, and that is that um, we've seen fraud increases. We've seen them increase far more in um, as a correlate of COVID, which I find interesting. In other words, fraud rates, particularly third-party fraud, has increased quite a bit in areas that are more affected by COVID. I found that just to be a really interesting pattern in general, that the, that the overall economic distress is correlated with the propensity of criminals to engage in that sort of stress. We've also seen that while volumes have decreased, general, I'm not talking about fraud volumes, I'm talking about volumes have generally decreased, applications and so forth, we found that fraud volumes, they haven't necessarily increased, although they are trending up, but th th that trend up is, is kind of small compared to the decrease in good volume. In other words, as a rate of applicants, the fraud rate of the applicant pool has gone through, I'm going to say through the roof. Um, but that's another kind of interesting result. A third interesting result is that retail was hit hard. And I'm talking about retail credit. And what, what we've kind of noticed is that financial, this economic crisis isn't new to retail. Excuse me. Financial crisis isn't new to banks. They know what to do in general when it comes to moderating credit cutoffs and, and announcing both in the, in the credit risk and the fraud space. They're experienced. Retailers, however, they are fighting for their lives. And in a, in a turn of a, of a dime, they had to move from cash register-based transactions to curb-based transactions. They had to reinvent their delivery mode, their delivery methods overnight without really having access to the training and process that's needed. They've also moved from that cash register that had, it, that had a, 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 a clear, say, credit process to somebody sitting with some sort of mobile phone kind of taking payments. So we've definitely seen it hit um, retail really hard. Um, and 
there's really a multi-pronged approach when it comes to those sorts of tools. When it comes to um, Traditional third-party fraud, what I mean by that is take identity takeover of some sort, whether it be credit or, or identity. It's really about verifying that PII and so forth, and we do offer a variety of solutions. Since the question asks, what sort of tools do you have? They have a variety of tools. Given all the different sources that Ankush talked about, what we can do is verify those identities against all of those sources, looking for that bigger picture. We've definitely found also that when we look at things like synthetic identity and synthetic identities, those are the ones that are hiding the most as credit risk because synthetic identities differ from third-party victim fraud because there is no victim. There's nobody to raise their hand and say, hey, look, hey, bank, my identity has been stolen and turn that fraud into a, a paperwork problem. Um, we definitely see those sorts of frauds lurking in that synthetic one, and we definitely see some patterns when, it, when we do network analysis, which we do – with our customers to really build those networks. So for example, what are the odds that you'd see some, a, a cluster of customers sharing lots of information that are all 15 years old? It just doesn't seem likely. And that, that kind of falls in a lot of our synthetic sorts of solutions. Um, so there's all sorts, of, um, all sorts of tools out there and the fraudsters are experimenting and the best thing for a fraudster is turmoil. It just provides them for a laboratory, and we do see them experimenting. Okay, great. Well, that does conclude our program for today. For those of you who submitted questions and we unfortunately could not get to, someone from LexisNexis Risk Solutions will get back to you as soon as possible after this program. I want to take this moment to thank our speakers, Ankush and Jeffrey, for their insightful presentations and for their answers to your questions. We appreciate uh, them lending their expertise for you today. Uh, again, we want to acknowledge and thank LexisNexis Risk Solutions for their sponsorship of this program. We really appreciate their support. Last and certainly not least, we want to thank all of you who attended this program today. Uh, we are hopeful that you will be joining us for future web seminars brought to you by American Banker and its partners. So on behalf of your host, your sponsor, and your presenters, Thank you very much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you have a great day.